strategies in other parts of the city, this strategy will work and has been working in the 12th district. We need to just expand the strategy. I would start there and also bring in the small developers, whether they're nonprofit developers or for-profit developers, to make these houses viable again. Um, sometimes these have to be demolished, and that's something that we need to think through, whether it's through the receivership process or it's a uh, city-owned house. Uh, and then in terms of the city-owned property, the city has to take care of those. We also have to figure out some of them are HABC-owned and some of them are mayor and city council-owned. So two things. One, they have to be taken care of because the city is the most egregious violator of the housing code. And two, uh, in the case of HABC homes, we need to negotiate with the federal government to say, look, you know, right now there's a regulation that says if you, if you take one down, you've got to put another one up. That's great. Let's think about how to use that strategy um, and, and do that. The other thing is to negotiate and get a waiver because we've got too many of these houses, and a lot of them can come down. The third thing is we've got to work within each community on a strategy. It's not just sweeping in and saying, here's what we've got to do. Let's work with each community about what they want to see in these various neighborhoods. One of the things that I found when I was going door-to-door the other day in the Midway area on Rob Street, there are several people who are living next to vacant houses, living next to vacant houses, and their homeowner's insurance has been canceled as a result. That is unacceptable because what then happens is people can't do rehab to their houses without the insurance. So it's a totally uh, huge problem in so many different ways, and we've got to not just get rid of the vacant houses, but we've got to do something about this insurance problem because, you know, Ms. Mary, Ms. Ann, Mr. Jones cannot rehab their houses without the insurance, and we've got to change that, and I'm proposing, I'll propose to put in a law to change that. So there are very specific things that we can do on vacant housing, and we have to do it now. We can't do it later. And there's lots of people who are very interested in investing. We've got nonprofit developers doing a lot of great work in um, the Oliver community where uh, they've got a partnership with the city to deal with those city-owned homes and also getting homes from receivership. There's other developers that we can use, and we've got to take a big-picture approach, and that's how I would approach it. Okay. Can can I follow up, please, just for one second? All right, thirty seconds. Okay. Um. I, I, okay. I, Miss 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 Ramos talks about these uh, outside small developers, and I would just like like to say we need to look at the resources that we have within the in the twelfth district I wasn't, and put I'm the sorry, people that already live in the twelfth twelfth district back to work. Those people are the ones who need jobs. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of bricklayers who live in the 12th district, a lot of plumbers uh, who who are currently without jobs. And so the problem is is that we always look outside of the district and not look at the people that we have who we owe uh, a job to, who we're supposed to uh, represent and who we're supposed to cater to. So I want to cater to the developers, the people that's in the 12th district, and not just developers, but people who own local construction companies within the uh, 12th district, put those people uh, can I to back, that back to and get people to move back to Baltimore. Okay. Uh, I was I'm trying to keep within the time frame, but Ms. Yeah. Ramos, I'll give you a chance to respond. 30 seconds. Thank you. I was not implying that we would be using outside developers. There are several developers within the Barclay community that are actually local contractors, as you suggested, that can come together and take on some of these housing uh, these housing issues. So um, I appreciate what you're saying, um, Mr. Brown, but I think that the, the issue is you're right. We have to bring in local, and I agree with that. I was not implying that we were going to do outside. These, develop, these uh, contractors and developers that I met when I was door-to-door in Barclay, they want to approve their community, and we've got to make it easy for them to do it. Okay. Um, our next next issue uh, is crime. Baltimore City has now been deemed as the sixth most dangerous city in America. What would Councilwoman Ramos or Councilman Brown do to rid the, the district or the city uh, of crime? Uh, we'll start with Ms. Ramos. Uh, well, I think that one of the couple of the main issues regarding crime are, are two things. One is we don't have enough for our young people to do, so they're getting in trouble. And two, vacant houses breed crime and drugs. 
And so we're bringing in opportunities, or there, where there are opportunities in the city to to create crime. So if we get rid of those opportunities, we'll get rid of the crime. Uh, I also think that we need to make sure that we give the resources that are needed to our uh, police officers uh, so that they can uh, do their do their jobs, and more importantly, work with communities to be able to to stand up and say, you know, we know who's doing this stuff and we can't take it anymore. Like, for instance, in the Dolly Park community where uh, young Sean Johnson uh, was killed right on the front porch uh, just randomly with no rhyme or reason, and the community has said, that's enough, and they're doing community walks, they're bringing in the police, there's uh, people that are making sure that there's resources in that community so that that never happens again. And we all have to stand up and say that that is enough. And it takes these three, the three-pronged strategy of getting rid of the vacant houses, providing things to do for our young people, including jobs and providing jobs in our communities, as well as making sure that we've got the resources uh, to the police to do their jobs. And then that fourth prong of making sure that communities, and as a council person, I would work with each of the communities and organize. Council people have to be organizers, not just legislators, but organizers to get a lot done and to get, bring uh, about the changes that we need, bring in resources, make sure that communities can stand up and say this is enough and they are getting support for doing that. And that's how I would address those things. It has to be a holistic approach. And I have to commend Major Russell over in the Eastern District. He gets it. He provided, he's doing this transformation team where he's looking at all the different things that help to cause some of the crime in our area and dealing with those issues as well as the enforcement piece. Uh, so you have to do, it's a whole comprehensive approach that has to be done. And, you know, I'm working on it, and we'll certainly continue to work on it to make it happen. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Brown, uh, <laughs> yes. your response? Uh, well, 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 you know what? This is the, this is the issue here. Um, in the 12th district where uh, the majority of the people are, are, are considered uh, middle and low class families, uh, mostly black people, right? Most of these people do not trust the police officers, and so the mm-hmm. reason why why we cannot get the community to work with the police officers is because we there is a lack of relationships, and so if people do not trust the police officers, how do we expect to reduce the crime? So my thing is, is that we need to work on a strategy to get the people and the police officers to start working together. That means we as a community have to hold the police department accountable for things. Now, I witnessed with my own eyes, walking outside my, my, my door, a police officer who came into the 12th district, right, 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 right where they live at, jacked a young guy, he was 16 years old, threw the guy on the ground, smacked him in his face for just running because he said he was throwing up gang uh, uh, gang signs. Okay, even if that was was the case, the disrespect that came from that officer after uh, after he uh, caught up with the guy, the the young guy's grandmother came outside. She is a uh, a seventy year old woman. This officer told this seventy year old woman who lived in this community who owns a property to back her bloop bloop up before he locked her up. That's the type of disrespect that is coming from our, our police mouths, and they wonder why communities aren't coming together to help the police officer. Secondly, so what I want to do is build those relationships, bring in the good officers. I'm not saying that all the police officers are bad. We have some great uh, uh, officers in our, police, uh, in, in our police department. I'm good friends with the police commissioner. He understands my issue as far as building relationships, and I worked with him on coming up with ways to connect our young people to start trusting the police officers again. And so the thing is, build those relationships. Secondly, of course, like what 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 Ms. Ramo says, I mean, it's common sense to build opportunities uh, for our young people so that they could have somewhere to go, so they won't have to be a part of a gang. The reason why young people join gangs is because it's something opening. They have a family. It's something that they can do and feel to, and something to be a part of. If we build positive, uh, positive things for our young people, then they will most likely. Uh, join uh, join them and Ms. Ramos also mentioned uh, the young guy Sean and 